Well, good morning, and welcome to the Pinyan Bible Church Worship Hour online. It's so good to have you with us. We thank the Lord that you were able to join us this morning at your computer or on your phone or on your TV set. And we just uh, praise the Lord for the ability that we have to get together. Uh, given the nature of our social distancing and the guidelines set, of, set down by our government, there's no way we can meet together during this uh, coronavirus, uh, uh, coronavirus uh, situation. But we can meet together like this. And we thank the Lord for the technology and the ability to do so. And you know, we have people tuning in from all over the, the country. It's been amazing to see how many are tuning in. And we would encourage you, if you have friends and relatives and neighbors who can't get out to their church, um, or maybe they don't go to church, to call them and have them tune in and join us here at the Pinyon Bible Church Worship Online. And maybe you are a member of another church and you're tuning in because your church doesn't have an online service. Well, it's great to have you with us as well. But we would encourage you to stay connected to your local assembly that even though we enjoy having you with us here, make sure you're faithful in your support, both financially and prayerfully for your own church. They have bills to pay just like ours and salaries to, to supply for the staff, and we want to encourage your faithfulness there. And once all this is over and we can actually get back together again, it would, you know, to be faithful in your attendance to that church and how we look forward in this place to having all of our folks back together again we miss our fellowship tremendously and long for the day when we can once again be here together in this room. Um, we want to be thinking about the Easter Sunday. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday and Easter the week following that. And we're not sure if we will be able to get together. We've heard the comments from our president about his, his hopefulness that that might be the case, but we just don't know. And so we want to kind of be prepared for the eventuality that we, we can't. And so I want you to be thinking right now of perhaps someone that you know who is either unchurched, doesn't know the Lord, or is in a situation where they don't have a church home. I want you to consider a name and then begin to pray for that person and pray that they would be able to tune in, maybe join you at wherever you are and tune in or from their home and join us for uh, Easter celebration here at Pinion Bible Church on Easter Sunday. And so be thinking about that. Pray for them every day. Ask God to, to burden their heart about their, their need for the Lord if they don't know the Lord again. But we want to have a wonderful uh, opportunity that day just to present the, the glories of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we encourage you to be praying about what will happen on Easter Sunday. Well, thank you again for joining us for worship today. We begin our services with a call to worship. This morning, it is coming from the 107th Psalm. And it'll be on the screen behind me. And I encourage you, if you would uh, like to join us as we read it. 107th Psalm, verses 1 through 3 and verse 43. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south? Whoever is wise, let him attend to these things. Let him consider the steadfast love of the Lord. And that is what we're going to be doing this morning, considering the steadfast love of the Lord. But well, we're pleased to have uh, Mr. Chuck France leading us in our worship music today. And Jerry, his wife, will be on our piano and our praise team will be here. So they'll come and we'd invite you to sing along with us. You'll be able to see the words on the screen. And won't you uh, join us in worship this morning in song. And so these are challenging times for all of us. And I must tell you that it is a little bit awkward for me at the moment to stand in front of mostly empty seats and uh, to lead worship in song to invisible people. But let's do the best that we can to worship our Lord, in, as scripture says, in spirit and in truth. Now, as awkward as this feels to me this morning, 
I'm sure it will feel a little bit awkward to you as well in just a moment when I ask you to sing along, but I intend to do so. Now, if you look around the room that you're in, chances are there aren't very many strangers there with you, and chances are those in the room with you have already heard you sing, whether it's in the shower or somewhere in the home. So don't be bashful. Please sing along with us. And listen now as I read from the book of James in chapter 1, verse 17. The Lord says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, he never changes. Today, our God is the same God he was when he parted the Red Sea. He is the same God that he was when he hung the moon and stars in space. He's the same God today that he was when he sent Jesus Christ to come down and suffer and die and to be raised again from the dead to save us from our sins. Because he never changes. He's that same God today that loved us that much and he loves us that much still. He is faithful. He never changes. So would you be bold enough to join us at home as we sing together? Great is thy faithfulness.
David wrote in Psalm 62, verses 5 through 7, For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge. Friends, the Lord's our rock. In him we hide. Our God is a shelter in the time of storm. of James in chapter 1 verses 11 and 12 says this for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass its flower falls and its beauty perishes so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Worship our Lord together with me as we sing, It is well with my soul.
It is our custom here at Penyan Bible Church each Sunday to stand and read God's word together. But you're not here, and I am. So I will read God's word, and uh, if you have your Bible nearby, pick it up and turn to uh, Psalms, the book of Psalms, chapter 139, and I'll be reading the entire chapter, Psalm 139. So listen as I read. To the choir master, a Psalm of David. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. And if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. I, my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God, How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, there are more than the sand. I awake, and I am still with you. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Chuck. We want to take some time to pray together as we prepare our hearts to look into God's word. And so let's pause just for a moment, focus our attention upon the uh, throne of our Lord, the place where he invites us to come and pray. Our Father in heaven, we think of that episode in the Old Testament where Moses was herding sheep in the desert and he saw a bush on fire that was not being consumed. And he heard a voice from the bush that invited him to come close, but in coming close, he was to take off his shoes because he was standing on holy ground. And we come this morning before your throne standing on holy ground. As we come into your presence through this avenue of prayer made available to us by the death of our Savior upon the cross who 
made a way through the veil, the invitation that we are to come to you and bring our needs. And so we come. But Lord, we do not come flippantly. We think of who you are, the great I am, the voice that revealed itself from that burning bush. When Moses asked, who should I tell them sent me? And you said, tell them that I am. And as we ponder who you are and the great attributes that you have, as the psalmist said, great are those thoughts of you, O Lord. We think of your omniscience as displayed in this Psalm of David so wonderfully that you know uh, all the places that we go if we ride the wings of the morning or in the depths of the sea. Even there, you are with us. We cannot go anywhere from your spirit. You know the words that are on our, uh, the thoughts of our, of our minds before they ever form words for our lips. How great is this knowledge you have of us. And Lord, your omnipresence, there's no place we can go where you are not. What a comfort it is as we think about, about this, that we are never alone. You promised in the word you would never leave us or forsake us. You told the disciples as you sent them forth to all the uttermost parts of the earth that you are with them always. And then, that, Lord, your omnipotence, that there's nothing too hard for you, that no matter how great the crisis may seem to us, no matter how hard the challenge, that you are more powerful than all. Lord, many are anxious. We truly are living in a weary land, it seems, as people are concerned about this coronavirus and its impact and effects. But how thankful we are that you are more powerful than the virus, that greater is he who is in us than he who's in the world. And so, Lord, we come resting secure in your care for us, in your presence with us. We read in Jeremiah where you told him to call unto you and you would answer and show great and mighty things which we know not. And so, Lord, we are calling upon you and we're asking for just that. We pray for those who have been taken ill by this virus. We know many have lost their lives around the world, in our own country, in our own state, that hearts have been broken, that families have been uh, 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 deprived of loved ones and uh, Lord we know great grief and sadness and we pray Lord for comfort for these hearts we pray for the doctors and the nurses truly the weary ones of this land the scientists who are seeking to find a cure or a vaccine we pray God you'd strengthen them and help them and grant them wisdom Lord, we pray, Lord, for uh, our first responders and those who are out there on the front lines and putting their own health at risk in attending to others. We ask God for your protection and for your wisdom for them as well. And Lord, I pray that to each one who hears my voice this morning, that Lord, they would know that you are the great I am you're not the great I was or the great I will be, but right here and now in our present time, you are the great I am. You are our God. And so we come to you knowing that you hear these requests, laying, laying them before you and asking for your help. We pray, Lord, by your spirit, you would grant these things, that you'd bring comfort to anxious hearts, you'd give strength to feeble knees. Lord, that you would increase our faith and help us to always cast our gaze to heaven. Now, Lord, we ask your help as we look into your word this morning. We pray that you would teach us, that you would encourage our hearts. Lord, that your Holy Spirit would do his work in each one of us. And this I pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you, the message this morning is going to come from the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew is the first of the four Gospels in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It will be in chapter 14. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. And I'm going to read verses 22 through 33. A familiar story, I think, to some, but one that is filled with very important lessons for us today. So listen or follow along as I read Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. Immediately he, that's Jesus, made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, the other side of the Sea of Galilee, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, as he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. On the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It's a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. It was on December the 10th of the year 1735 that a ship named Simmons departed the British coast for America. It was one among a flotilla of three ships carrying some 500 settlers that were led by Colonel James Oglethorpe to the colony of Savannah, Georgia. He had established the colony three years before. He had gone back to England to advertise for the colony, to get more settlers, and to find an English clergyman who could go and minister to the colony. He had heard of Mr. John Wesley, who had been holding great meetings in England, and he asked him to join him on this trip. And at first, the 33-year-old Wesley was quite reluctant to take such a journey until his mother, Susanna, stepped in and encouraged him to go. And along with him, he took his brother Charles, the great hymn writer, and a friend named Benjamin Ingram. Also on board the ship were a group of 26 Moravians of the Bohemian Brethren movement and others who had been recently released from debtor's prison. So they began their, joy, their journey across the Atlantic, east to west, in the winter, in the North Atlantic. Um, it's typically a time when the seas can get very rough. And their flotilla in, encountered three furious gales that hit the ship. And during one of these, the captain, a man named Cornish, had just to let the ship drive into the wind. There was no way to control it. In his journal, John Wesley would write, the ship not only rocked to and fro in the utmost violence, but shook and jarred with so unequal and grating emotion that one could not but with great difficulty keep one's hold on anything, nor stand a moment without it. Every 10 minutes came a shock against the stern or the sides of the ship, which one would think would dash the planks into a thousand pieces. He then noted in his journal that the storm was very high, afraid with an exclamation point. I plainly showed that I was unfit, for I was afraid to die. 
And during this storm, the Moravians would meet as usual at their, for their 7 p.m. worship service. And Wesley's friend, Mr. Ingram, noted in his diary that the gale was furious, I observed it well, and truly never saw anything hereto so solemn and majestic. The sea sparked and smoked as it had been on fire, and the air darted forth lightning, and the wind blew so fierce that you could barely look at it in the face and draw your breath. But while the Moravians were singing a, a song, a, a great wave broke over the ship that day, and the mainsail was split with a loud crack, and water poured down upon them all, and there was a dreadful clamor. Gear was falling down upon the deck of the ship, and the hatches were splintered, and even the sailors cried out in fear. And most of the passengers, Wesley said, were terrified out of their senses. But these good Moravians, after looking up for a moment, went on with their psalm. This uh, magnificent example of calm piety and courage had a profound and a lasting impact upon John Wesley, he knew that they possessed a spiritual quality that he did not have. And our text here finds the disciples in this boat in much the same fix as the Wesleys and Mr. Ingram. In the midst of a terrifying storm, uh, afraid for their own lives, and like the Wesleys, they would experience in this storm lead them to a, a fuller realization of, of God's grace and a deeper understanding for the person of Christ and his care for them. This episode takes place right after the feeding of the 5,000. After Jesus had fed these 5,000, the people clamored. They wanted to take Jesus and make him the king. But Jesus knew it wasn't his time yet. And John chapter 6, he writes, after the, or John writes, after the people saw this miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to make withdrew again to a mountain by himself. But before he goes to this mountain, he makes these disciples, and the language is very emphatic, verse 22, immediately he made his disciples get into this boat, and go before him to the other side. Now these disciples must have been thinking, now wait a minute, Jesus. This is what you've been telling us about, your kingdom that's going to come. You'll establish it here upon the world. And now the people are wanting to do just that, and, and you say no? I thought this is what we've been waiting for. For two years they've been listening and wondering. Now it was within their grasp, and Jesus said no. The time is not right. And so he tells these men to get into the boat and to go to the other side. Now they had heard on the Mount of Transfiguration, or at his baptism rather, some of them had heard the Father say to the Son, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And he tells the people to listen to him. Earlier in the book, as Jesus approached those who had been demon-possessed, even the demons cried out, this is, uh, what do you want with us, O Son of God? You are come to torture us before the, anointed, before the appointed time? There had been a lot of uh, evidence given in the miracles that he had worked, in the testimony of the Father and even of these demons, about who Jesus really was, that he was God's Son, the Son of God, come to earth, God in the flesh. But these disciples still just didn't get it. They were a slow bunch. And here, feeding 5,000 people, watching this miracle, taking apart and handing out the loaves and the fishes, they still just did not get it. And so there are big lessons for them to learn. And it's going to take a big storm to help teach them, just as it was for Wesley's and Mr. Ingram. Now, as we walk through the the remainder of this story. Uh, it's, great, it's wonderful to focus upon the storm or to look at Peter walking on the water. What a marvelous miracle that was. But the main subject of this story is Jesus Christ himself and no other. And so our focus will be upon him this morning.
And the first thing I want you to notice is his knowledge of the circumstances. In verses 22 through 25, he made them get into, into the boat to go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when the evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from land. Uh, another passage in John that tells us it was probably two to three miles from the coast. It was being beaten by the waves and the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch, he came to them walking on the sea. The strength of the language here of this verse tells us that he constrained them to go. They did not want to go, but he made them get into this boat and go. He had just fed these 5,000 people. It was getting late. They wanted to send them away. And so we assume by this time it was getting close to, to the setting of the sun. And they boarded the boat, and they began to make their way across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus goes up to the mountain to pray, which is something good for us to contemplate. If the Son of God himself needed to go for a time of solitude and prayer and refreshment, how much more do we need to do that? The cause of spiritual depression and anxiety and failure in our own walk in the Christian life can usually be linked to our neglect of the ministry of prayer in our own lives. But Jesus sends these men on and he goes up to the mountain to pray. And of course they were in great danger. According to John 6 and verse number 19, they were three and a half miles out when the trouble hit. It says they were beaten by the waves, that they were straining at the oars, Mark tells us. And these were experienced fishermen. They were in their home waters. They knew this lake. They knew how these storms could come up. They knew this boat. They knew the rigging. And yet these men who made their living on the water were terrified at the possibility that their life may be coming to an end. In just a short time, they went from enjoying the accolades of the crowd to fighting for their lives in the raging waves. And when you're out that far in a boat on the water, the closest land is straight down. Not a pleasant thought. The language is graphic here. The danger is real. And in their thinking, Jesus was miles away up on a mountain praying. In a similar situation, Mar uh, Jesus was sleeping in the back of the boat during another storm, and they awakened him and he calmed the sea. In that episode, it was daylight. But here, it's at night. It's in the dark. And Jesus, in their thinking, was nowhere near. So they were directed to go. They're in the midst of danger. And they were there for a while. Verse 25 says that he came during the fourth watch of the night. Now, if we assume they left about sundown, the fourth watch of the night is between 3 and 6 a.m., according to that timing. So they would have been on the, on the boat, on the water there for anywhere from 8 to 12 hours. But yet still, Jesus didn't come to them until the fourth watch. And you wonder, did his delay uh, indicate some sort of indifference on his part for their well-being? Well, of course not. It, no, it was all part of the preparation. It was all part of the test. It was all part of the lesson. Training them, preparing them for the day when they would have to face trials when Jesus would not be physically present with them. They'd been used to the trials when he was standing right next to them. But after his crucifixion, his resurrection and ascension, they would have to face very difficult times without his physical presence. And that's kind of where we live today, isn't it? Facing difficult times without the physical presence of our Lord. Learning to trust him when he can't be seen. So he delayed going to them. It reminds us of the time when his good friend Lazarus had died and word had come to Jesus from Mary and Martha that Lazarus had died. And rather than rushing off to their side, he waits four days before he goes. Um, the delay. And he loved Peter. 
And there was a time in the book of Acts when Peter was arrested and he was scheduled for execution. They'd already executed John. Peter was next in line. And he was kept in chains in a cell. He was going to be executed the next day. And then the angel came and unlocked the door, took the chains off of his, his hands and his legs and led him out. But Jesus let him lie there in Herod's prison till the last hour of the last watch of the last night before his intended execution, before he delivered him. I wonder what Peter must have been thinking those prior days and hours leading up to this. Well, a great lesson simply is to learn that heaven's clock goes at a different rate from our own timepieces. God has his own schedule, but it doesn't mean he's forgotten us or that he's unaware of what's going on. He will not always keep us from the dangers of the storm because he knows, like we do, that steel is made in the furnace, that wine, fine wine, comes after the grapes are crushed, that the roots grow deep when the winds grow strong. It's the challenges and the difficulties that help us to grow our faith. But regardless of the intensity of the storm or the crisis or the virus, our loving Lord is watching over us always. In Exodus chapter 3 and verse number 7, back before the releasing of the children of Israel from Egypt, the Lord told Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I've given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their sufferings. The words of the Lord to Moses from the burning bush. See, God knew. Phil Johnson wrote, The eyes of God are upon me. They see each step I take. The arms of God are around me. They keep me safe and secure. And he knows where I am every minute of every day. He knows each thought I take. He knows each word that I might say. And although there have been times that I've stepped out of his will, I've never been out of his care. Isn't that a marvelous verse? We read from the 139th Psalm, verse number nine. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me, your right hand will hold me. So his knowledge of the circumstances, but also there is his protection in the crisis of life. These disciples were afraid. It says they were terrified. They cried out in fear. These men were not expecting uh, Jesus to help them. They were expecting to die on the ocean that night or on the, on the sea that night. But when they saw him approach, they thought he was a ghost. Their old sailor superstitions kicked in and they mistook him for the messenger of doom. They thought it was over. And I was thinking, you know, too often we do not recognize God's workings in the storm either. We're so absorbed in the circumstances and the difficulties, we, we fail to see him through those things. As one man wrote, our tears or our fears weave a, a veil that hides him or the darkness obscures him. And we forget often who is in control of the circumstances in which we find ourselves. It was Chuck Swindoll who said, anxiety highlights the human viewpoint and strangles the divine. So we become fearful. But, but then we hear his voice. And those who were deceived by his appearance knew him when they heard his voice. Even amid the, even amid the howling winds and the spray hitting in their face, they heard his voice and their fear subsided. The voice of Jesus brought calm. Now, where can we hear the voice of Jesus today? Well, I'm reminded of the old hymn, more about Jesus and his word, holding communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, making each faithful saying mine. You want to hear the voice of Jesus today? Pick up your Bible and read it. Ask God to show you. Ask God to teach you as you read it. 
Read it with an open heart. It's there that God speaks to us through his word. It's there we find encouragement. It's there that we find hope. And notice what the Lord says in verse number 27. Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. We may not know what's going to happen in the future. We rarely do. And the future may seem bleak to some, and the pressures may be intense. The sky may be dark, and the coronavirus may be in the wind. But the believer need never fear. As we said before, 365 times in the scriptures, you find some variation of the command, do not be afraid or fear not. Why? Because Jesus is drawing near to us in the storm. Those waves that so scared the disciples out of their wits, the Lord made it a highway for him to walk upon, to come to where they were. He was using this stormy gale as a, as a seminar to teach them. And we see also his, his love as he cultivates their faith. Verse 28, he said, Peter said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. And so Peter got, Peter got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out. And we see Peter's faith here. Peter was the kind of guy who could do anything but sit still. He often spoke before he thought. He was very rash in some of the things that he did. In many ways, he can be faulted. But one thing can be said about Peter. He loved Jesus. And he was willing to, to do anything, although it may have been imperfect and may have been weak. His love for Jesus was real. And so when he saw Jesus, he wanted to go be with him. And so Jesus said, come. Now, Jesus will never invite us to do something that he cannot help us do. And when the Lord invites us to come, we can go, knowing that he will protect us and guide us. And he told Peter to come. Peter begins to walk out there on the water. What a miracle this is. But now he finds himself in a situation like he's never been in before. He's been through a lot of stormy, rough water in the boat, <laughs> but now he's in the storm out of the boat, and that's a totally different experience for this young man. And this was important. Very true principle in our Christian walk, that you're never really gonna grow in your faith until you're pushed into these areas that are outside your comfort zone. Faith grows when it's challenged and when it's used not when times are easy and we're comfortable and we feel safe. We usually don't grow spiritually in times like that. And our loving Lord, he cultivates our faith by sometimes drawing us out of the safety of our, of our little ships and asking us to walk among the waves. And that's what he was doing here with Peter to help him in this situation. I was sitting in a funeral home many years ago preparing to officiate a service for a member of our church when we were down in Georgia. And in this little room that they have off to the side where ministers can go and gather their thoughts, they had a small little book of quaint sayings and poems. And I picked it up just in passing the time to read it. And I came across the words of Robert Browning Hamilton that stuck to me <laughs> um, it pierced my heart in a good way. Hamilton wrote, I walked a mile with pleasure. She chattered all the way, but left me none the wiser for all she had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow, and ne'er a word said she, but oh, the things that I did learn when sorrow walked with me. Amazing truth in this little poem by Robert Browning Hamilton. But it's in the difficult times that we learn. And here Peter is learning. 
James 1.12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Peter's out there in the water, but then he begins to look around. It says he was afraid and began to sink. You know, as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was doing fine. But then he began to look around at the circumstance he found himself in. Now, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm not in the boat. Something's not normal or natural about this. He took his focus off of the Christ who had called him and put his focus upon the raging waves around him. And immediately he began to be afraid. And when the fear struck, he began to sink. He knew these waters. He was out there in the direction of Christ. He was fine until he took his gaze off of Christ. And our faith is sure to fail when we keep our focus upon the circumstances that surround us rather than upon the Lord himself. So, you know, we need to be very careful in times like these. We're told to set our minds upon things above, not on things upon the earth. And he begins to sink. And so what happens when he begins to sink? He cries out. <clears throat> he said, Lord, save me. Boy, what an eloquent prayer that is. <laughs> and sometimes we get uh, caught up in the idea that when we pray, we have to use some sort of flowery language or some kind of a uh, oratorical uh, uh, process to get the Lord to listen or to answer. But here's a heart felt prayer from a desperate man and what happened the Lord reached out his hand and took hold of him and brought him to the boat um, you know the glory of this is that when Peter began to sink Jesus was near and the same is true for us if you know Christ is your savior when you begin to sink he's always close by just a quick prayer, and his hand is there to reach, to take hold of us. And notice it wasn't Peter taking hold of him. It was Jesus taking hold of Peter. And that makes all the difference in the world because our grip can often be weak. But his is always strong. But then he asked the question. Jesus asked the question of Peter. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? But it's a question that Peter cannot answer. And how silly it seems as we look back on our life, it seems that we doubted after God has answered our prayers, we, how foolish we were to have doubted God. But often that's the way it happens. The next thing we see here is the Lord's power and how he calms this tempest. You know, the most spectacular part of this entire ministry, uh, this entire episode, this entire miracle, was accomplished without Jesus' word. Verse 32, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. He didn't say, peace be still, like he did in the other storm. When they got into the boat, it all stopped. It's the Lord who created the laws of nature can alter them at his will. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 1 says he upholds all things. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Nature is under his control. The storms are under his control. Hurricanes are under his control. The sunshine, the harvest, and even novel strains of viruses are all under the control of our almighty God. Now, just a few thoughts as we wrap this up this morning. It would be so reassuring if we could say that the application of this message is that Jesus could wipe out the coronavirus like he did that storm on Galilee. Wouldn't that be awesome? But there's no promise in the Bible that we're going to wake up in the morning and all will be calm and all of our problems will be wiped away. We ought to pray. We ought to cry out as Peter did. But we know from experience that we can often pray long and hard and still uh, 
that will not keep us from getting sick or even seeing loved ones die. We read in the scriptures of the example of people like Job, a righteous man who lost everything except his life. We think of Paul, the greatest Christian who ever lived, author of three-fourths of the New Testament. He prayed three times asking the Lord to remove a thorn in his flesh. And the Lord says, no, I receive more glory when you have the thorn than it would be than I would if, you, if I removed it from you. Even the Lord Jesus himself, the, the perfect man, walked upon this earth with never committing a sin, never doing anything wrong. And what they do to him? They crucified him. No. So just what is the good news here if it's not that? Well, we can have the confidence here that as his children, that Jesus is watching over us, that he is praying for us, and that by his spirit, he is present with us. Jesus saw those disciples out there on the lake as they were straining at the oars. He saw the difficulties they were going through. He let them go through those difficulties for hours before he came down and walked out there on the sea to deliver them. Sometimes we wonder, does Jesus care? I'm not sure what was going through the mind of Frank Grafe back in 1929. Perhaps it was the onslaught of the Great Depression. I don't know. But that man sat down and he asked, does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth or song? As the burdens are pressed and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long? That's the question. But in the refrain, he gives the marvelous answer. Oh, yes, he cares. He, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief when the days are weary and the long nights are dreary. I know my Savior cares. Well, this coronavirus has put people at risk. And maybe some of you. I can honestly say that we've been living risky lives since the day we were born. People die every day, get sick every day from things that, that uh, uh, just seem to come from nowhere. Yet, we know as God's people, and hear me well, we know as God's people that not one hair of our head will fall to the ground without his knowledge. We read in the 139th Psalm that all of our days are written in his book. And we will not be taken from this earth. Our lives will not be shortened. No virus can change that number that he has written in his book for you or me. Now that is God's providential care for us. And in these times of what seems like public panic, or they force us to, to reassess, to, to realign, to align our professed belief, our professed faith, with our actual faith. We all say that we believe that God is sovereign, that he is taking care of us. But we reveal our true loyalty, our true trust, when the world goes into meltdown. It reveals the true loyalties of our heart, where we really stand. And the answer that was forced upon Wesley and his brother and Mr. Ingram in the North Atlantic, um, and on many today, is really the question that Jesus asked Peter. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Is your faith real? Is it authentic, saving faith? Or is it just words? Do you really know the Lord Jesus? And are you assured of your eternal destiny? Do you know what he did for you on the cross that day? 
When they finally landed in Savannah, a young Moravian pastor spoke to John Wesley and he asked him this question. He said, do you yourself know, do you have the witness within yourself? Does the Spirit of God bear witness with your spirit that you are truly a child of God? And he asked that question because he saw Wesley, an ordained Anglican clergyman, who was going to be a missionary to the colony of Savannah, he saw how fearful he was to die in that storm upon the ocean. Wesley was impacted by how calm the Moravians were through all that difficulty. And so this Moravian pastor asked Wesley, do you know that you are a child of God? Wesley said he was shocked. He didn't know how to answer. And finally the pastor said, do you know Jesus Christ? And Wesley, after a moment, said, I know that he is the Savior of the world. To which the Moravian pastor says, true, but do you know that he has saved you? And Wesley's only reply was that he hoped he had died for him. He had no assurance at all. These events on this voyage shook Wesley to his soul. But the end result was to Wesley's good. For it was some time later after his return to England that in the Aldersgate Church listening to someone reading a preface from Martin Luther's commentary on Romans that his heart was strangely warmed, he said. He felt at that moment he had come to understand this matter of what it means to be born again, to be converted. Here was a man who was a minister of the gospel, supposedly going to reach others who he himself was not a converted man. It shook him to his soul. It was good for Wesley to be on that voyage. And if the coronavirus succeeds in shaking us to our souls, then it has been good for us and for our country as well. When Jesus lifted Peter from the waves and he and Jesus got into the boat with the others, the winds ceased. The winds went calm. And you'll notice the reaction of the disciples. There were no high fives or fist bumps or I guess elbow bumps, you know, no hugs and way to go, Jesus, what a dude you are. No. What was their response? It says they worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. And friend, no matter what the crisis, if it leads us to worship, then we've learned a valuable lesson. And my prayer for our country, for our world, is that we would learn the lesson the coronavirus hasn't taken God off guard. It wasn't a surprise to him. The issue is, what will we learn from it? Will it better prepare us for eternity and in our walk with him? Well, let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for, your, for the Bible. We thank you for your honesty. It shows us like we really are. It doesn't flower up our image. It shows this great apostle Peter as a man who was afraid, crying out for help. And Lord, there are people listening right now who are watching who may be afraid of a number of things. And Lord, if they cry out to you for help, you will be there to help them. So I pray, God, that they would honestly look deep within, that they would use this time of introspection to see if their faith is authentic, is it real, is it genuine? Are they ready for what may happen? Should they contract the virus? Lord, may the end result in all of this be that we worship you as the Son of God, the Savior of the world. In this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again.
We're going to sing a song about Jesus. And I hope, if nothing else, that this uh, reminder from God's word will cause you to be excited and thrilled about who Jesus is. first verse reads, Who can cheer a heart like Jesus? By his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. I pray that you can call him yours this morning. So we're going to close out the service with the singing of our final hymn, All That Thrills My Soul is Jesus. Again, I would thank you for joining us in worship this morning. I would encourage you, if you have questions about your relationship with Christ, you can go to our church website, and down at the bottom, uh, you'll find certain links to a link called The Story, uh, a link called Christianity Explored, and one called I Am Second. And as you explore these links and the resources that are there, they can lead you to how you can know if you have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and help you grow 
in your faith if you do. Well, thank you again for joining us. We pray God's blessings upon you. And we leave with these words from the book of 2 Thessalonians. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. And to this we say, Amen. And thank you.